Well, good morning, Heights Church. How are we doing? All right. Thank you. Let me ask you a question. Are you glad to be at church today? Amen. Well, I am honored to be with you today. As Trey said, my name is Chris, and I I do have the privilege of serving as a lead pastor at BT Church down there in South Texas, Uh, but I also have the privilege of hanging out with you this weekend. I'm so honored that Trace would ask me to come back and speak to the students this weekend, and you know this already. You have a phenomenal group of students. Um, The church, not just the future, we say the future, but not just the future, the church today is in good hands with the teenagers that God is raising up and calling out. Uh, And you know, yeah, you can clap. And you know this as well. Uh, um, You're blessed with uh, Trace and Rachel, uh, the whole student ministry staff, the volunteers, just completely amazing uh, this weekend in what they've done to provide this opportunity for your students. Uh, Really, all the staff that I've encountered uh, at the Heights are truly uh, first class. And uh, you know this, again, much better than I do, but also blessed with your lead pastor, Dr. Gary Singleton, And I just want to say, Gary, thanks for the invitation to preach today. I don't take it lightly, uh, and I pray that God will do uh, his will in this time. So, Well, this weekend, uh, we talked about this topic, this theme of all my life. And you heard that there in the 23rd Psalm. We know verse 6. Many of us may have learned it this way. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. (coughs) Excuse me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so that theme all my life, what we've done this weekend is I've just walked through Psalm 23 with your students. And one of the tensions in that powerful verse six is that we know that God's goodness and his faithful love, we know that his faithfulness and his mercy, they they do indeed both lead us and pursue us. But some days it just maybe doesn't feel that way, right? I mean, every day is not a Friday, actually. And and every morning isn't roses and rainbows. And I I haven't seen my miniature Dotson magically transform to a unicorn, right? We have challenging days. We go through hardships and heartaches. And so how do we balance the two? How do we live today believing with all of our hearts that God's goodness and faithfulness, they do indeed lead and pursue us all the days of our lives, but how do, we, how do we do that whenever things don't seem that great, when we go through the storms of life? And also, how do we do, do that knowing that while we live today, today is not as good as it gets. This world is not our home. We have a forever home that awaits us. 2016, my wife and I took our four children to Disney World, and I had the great idea to make it a road trip. I live in McAllen, Texas. That's about as south as you can get. So we loaded up for a 20-hour drive, and all the parents in the room, we have four children, uh, you, knew, you, you know that about two hours into the trip, the questions began, and the number one question was what? Are we there yet? My favorite. Well, hear me today, beloved. We're not there yet. But don't forget, there is a there that's waiting for us. We're on the way, but we're not there yet. And so this morning for a few minutes, what I want to do is I want to encourage us on how we can live in the now, but do so with a not yet mindset. How can we live in the now, but do it with a not yet mindset? And so if you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do. We're going to be in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 21. If you can turn there, I'll I'll give you a few pointers about my preaching this morning. Uh, Here's the first pointer. Um, I I love an interactive group, and so you can uh, laugh at my jokes even if they're not funny. You missed that opportunity, but anyways, whatever. Uh, You you can say amen and praise the Lord. You can clap. You can do all those things. Uh, And I believe actually the act of preaching while while I'm speaking, it's actually an engaging act that we're doing. And so in a few moments when we wrap this service up, if you leave and you think to yourself, I don't think that was that good of a sermon, I want you to know it's 51% your fault, okay? So just, you know, work with me a little bit. And then one other thing you should know about my preaching um, is that because I enjoy an interactive group, uh, really, uh, anytime you say amen or praise the Lord or you raise, you, you clap, whatever it might be, anytime you, you do that, this weird phenomenon happens and two minutes of the sermon gets automatically taken off, okay? And so don't abuse your, don't abuse your power. Don't abuse your power. Wield that responsibly, okay? 
Well, now that we're in Revelation chapter 21, I want to walk through the first five verses. Many of us are aware of the fact that a disciple of Jesus named John wrote this book. He was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he's writing about a vision that the Lord had given him. Now, Revelation today is really a, a hotly debated book because we talk about when's Jesus coming back and where does the tribulation fall and when's the rapture, and those are all great questions and great areas of study. But because it can be somewhat confusing, the book of Revelation is what's called apocalyptic literature, and because it can be hard to understand, sometimes the very concrete parts of the book we can miss. I believe that Revelation 21 is a pretty concrete part of the book. So this is what John would write, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. There's a lot going on there, but I, I just want to point some things out in each of these verses. In verse 1, as John says th that he saw this vision of a new heaven and a new earth, he, he then says, and the sea was no more. Now, does that mean that in the new heaven, in the new earth, that there are no oceans? I, I don't know. I, I have my reservation, but I haven't been there yet. So I, I, I don't know, but, but what I believe is that maybe he's saying something on a deeper level, because if you study the thought culture of the day, what we know is that many people who would hear this or read this, the sea would represent the world of uncertainty. And so when he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the former heaven and earth had passed away and the sea was no more, what, what if he is saying that all those things that cause uncertainty in our hearts, that they're gonna be done away with? I mean, the seas, the oceans today, they still carry that concept, don't they? I mean, how deep is the ocean? How, 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 how vast are the seas? My wife and I, every summer, we take our kids to South Padre Island. It's just around the corner from us. And before I had children, um, when, I, when I was younger, and I know you probably are pegging me at about 29 right now. Um, I'll actually be 45 next week. So, uh, but before I had kids, I, I was foolish. I know that's shocking that young men can be foolish. But, uh, and I didn't really think about the risks involved in my decisions, but now that I have kids, I feel like all I do is calculate risks. But one year while we were at the island, I was explaining to my children the concept of the sandbars. You know, you're on the shore, and I said, hey, if we swim out a little ways, there's a second sandbar. And while it gets deep, when you get there, it's shallow. My kids said, well, Dad, can we go? I said, absolutely, we can go. Let, let's go. Uh, notice that Mom stayed on the shore. She stayed on the beach. That, that's foreshadowing wisdom. And so the four, five of us, four kids and myself, we swam out and we got to the second sandbar. They're splashing and they're, they're going crazy and there are lots of fun and I'm thinking it's about time to swim back and one of my kids says, hey dad, is there another sandbar? I said, yeah, there is. It's a little farther than this one was, but yeah. Well, dad, can we swim to it? I said, absolutely, let's go. So we began to swim to that next sandbar, which was definitely a little farther out. And so as we're swimming against the current and as the tide is pushing us down the shoreline, I began to notice one of my sons was struggling to swim. And in that moment, panic set in. Not for him, he was great, but for dad. And I, di I didn't take long to have a discussion. I said to the other three, we're going back. And I got my arm around him and I swam as hard and as fast as I could back to the shore. Because when you're at the beach and you look out, you know what you don't see? The other side. It's, it's uncertain. And John, writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, listen, there is a promised reality for us. And, and part of that promised reality is all the things in this life that conjure up and create uncertainty in our hearts of how things are going to go. That will be no more. In verse 2, he says, I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. He says he saw the holy city coming down and he, he said he, he, he uses this language. He says that the, the city was prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. We know that the church referred to as the body of Christ is also known as the bride of Christ. And if we went two chapters over to Revelation 19, which we don't have time to do this morning, but we would read about this imagery of what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. This celebration when the bride of Christ, the people of God, sons and daughters, are brought into fullness in his presence. And here's the deal, beloved. Today we have a task to do. 
Today, we have a responsibility to press in and know Jesus more every day, whether you got saved this week and gave your life to Christ as a student, or whether you've been following Jesus for 50 plus years, all of us need to know him more. And as we know him more, we also need to make him known. And while there's a task today, the fact that the bride and the bridegroom will be brought together for the celebration, what that means is there's a task today, but there is a party waiting. There is a celebration beyond comprehension when we are no longer in the now, but we have finally made it to the not yet. Verse three, then I heard a loud voice (coughs) from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity. And he will live with them and they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and be their God. Now we know today we have this amazing promise of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. He is inside of us. But we also know that that it's it's not yet what it's going to be. There's the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And then what happens? The things of earth grow strangely dim. And so... John is given this vision and God has inspired him to write that there will be this moment where while we have the amazing reality of the Holy Spirit inside of us, we will be face to face with Jesus. Verse four, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. That's a promise. It's a promise. I preached this exact passage a few years ago at my father's funeral. It's one of the hardest things I've done in ministry. And as grieved as I was that my dad would no longer be in this life with me, as I read those words, I couldn't help but be comforted. That while tears would still stream down my cheeks, while pain would still be a reality, while grief and sorrow and even my physical death if Jesus doesn't come back first are in front of me, those things are no longer realities for all those that have gone to be with the Lord. It's a promise of what's to come. And then verse five. And then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. He says, look, I'm making everything new. Write this down. This is faithful and true. You could say it today. You can take this to the bank. Now, this is what I think is interesting. In verse four, as I believe it is the voice of Jesus, he is saying that I will wipe every tear away from their eyes. And I, and, and sickness and and." Sorrow will be no more, and death will be no more. And what Jesus is doing, I'm not an English major, but he is speaking in the future tense, because while in this life we have those problems, when we get to our forever home, there are no more tears, there is no more pain, there's no more sorrow, and there is no more death. Now what's interesting though, is just logically it would make sense for the flow for Jesus to be speaking and John to be writing and and for him to say, Jesus to say, I will wipe away future every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more future. Pain and sickness and sorrow will be no more future. And then for Jesus to say, check it out. Behold, I will make everything new. Like that makes sense. But Jesus flipped the script. Because while in verse four he was speaking of the promised reality of our life in heaven, he says something powerful in verse five. Because he didn't say, I will make everything new, did he? He spoke in what's called a continuous present. And he said, behold, I am making everything new. You say, Chris, what's the big deal? Because while I cannot wait to set my eyes on Jesus in my forever home, I know in my heart that I don't wait till then to be made new. 
I know that today in the midst of all of my struggles and all of my foolishness and all of my mistakes and all of my ups and downs, that by the power of the empty tomb and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me, while I am waiting for that not yet moment where all the tragedy of life will be done away with, where suffering will have an expiration date, while I wait for that, I do not wait for Jesus to begin the process of making me new. He has been working on me for 25 years. He's got some more work to do, no doubt, but he has not left me or given up on me. He is indeed making me new right now. So how do we balance it? Maybe today's a great day. Maybe last week was a great week. Praise God. But what about when it's not? While we understand the promise of heaven How do we balance the tension living in the now with the not yet mindset? How do we believe in the core of our being that only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live? How do I believe that to be true today when many of the things I see don't agree with that? And how do I also know that one day that will be my reality? Well, we walk through the text and so if you'll allow me, let me just give you three practices that I would encourage you to think about. Just to make it practical, okay? Let me give you three tips, three suggestions to try to balance living in the now with a not yet mindset. And here's the first thing that I would encourage you to think about. Maybe you want to write this down. We should start by expressing our gratitude. We should start by expressing our gratitude. The Bible's filled with this, by the way. Paul would say to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter four, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. He thought that was a pretty important theme, so in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16, he says, again, rejoice always. Back to Philippians chapter four, he would say this in verse six. He would say, don't worry about a thing because every little thing's gonna be all right. Now, that was Bob Marley. no. He said, don't worry about anything, but in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, listen, some of us are really good at letting God know what we want and need from him, but we could get a little better at thanking him for what we already have. When I find myself wrestling, feeling like this world is so horrible and everything's against me and it's just, it's just always, you know, rainy days, I need to recognize all the things I have to be thankful for and there is not a believer in Jesus on the planet that doesn't have the most amazing thing to be thankful for and that's Jesus. And when I'm like, today is amazing. It couldn't, when the Cowboys finally win another Super Bowl, praise God, I speak it my lips to God's ears, when it happens, as amazing as it will be, what I know is that's nothing compared to what's waiting for me. And I can be thankful for that. We express our gratitude. The writer of Hebrews would say this in chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Now let me just take a moment to talk about that real quickly. Since we are receiving a kingdom This year, you you probably aren't aware of this, they're keeping it a secret, but this year is an election year. It is is my favorite time to be a pastor. But, But come the end of this year, there will be elections that will indeed have implications on the local level, the state level, the national level. And I believe we have both a freedom and responsibility to vote according to the voter guide that is the word of God. However, when an election doesn't go the way we think it should, when the the candidate of our choice doesn't fill the Oval Office, the king still sits on the throne. And the text doesn't say that we are receiving a presidency that cannot be shaken. It doesn't say that we're receiving a democracy that cannot be shaken. While I am overwhelmingly thankful to live in this country, I'm a citizen first of the kingdom of God. And since I will receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, what does the writer of Hebrews say? Let us give thanks. We balance the tension with gratitude. Secondly, 
we balance the tension through the discipline of examining our lives. It is not a pleasant practice, folks. I wish that I could have done it once when I gave my life to Jesus and never again do I have to examine my life. Sometimes I want to do some things with my money and God wants me to do something else. And then he reminds me, Chris, it's not your money, it's mine. And sometimes I want to do something with my time and God wants me to do something else. And sometimes I want to do something with my talents and God wants me to do something else. And so I have to continually practice examining my life. And it's through the practice of examination that I become more aware of the presence of God, which encourages me (coughs) with the promises of God. It's a continual, ongoing reality. And I believe in our Western culture, we have bought into a honey-dipped lie. Because what we believe is we believe it's okay for us to have a list of priorities. But if you look up the word priority in Webster, what you'll find out is that it is a state or fact of something being more important. Now, my marriage and my children and my ministry, they're all extremely important. But if all of those things are priorities with Jesus, something is wrong. We can't have priorities. We need to have a priority. And it's through examination that I continue to assess and evaluate where is my allegiance to Jesus. I served as a student pastor for 10 years and I believe about 20 years ago, the church, not the world, not society, I believe the church allowed something to happen that I think was a huge loss for us. And, and I, uh, I hope you're not offended. If you are, I do apologize. I also fly home in a few hours and so Gary can clean up the mess. Uh, A phenomenon occurred within the last two decades. It wasn't new, but it took a different form, and that is youth sports. And we cart our kids around the state and the country to play tournaments and games. And let me, I'm, I get it, I'm for youth sports. I have a daughter. Um, I have three boys and one girl, and she's got my heart, definitely. And she, not to, not to brag, she's a really good basketball player. And my wife and I, we invest money and time for her to get better. But the reality is that the, there are limited opportunities for her because we have decided that largely we are not going to travel on Sunday so she can play basketball tournaments. We should not be shocked when the world doesn't have Jesus as a priority. We should just be shocked when the church is okay with it. I don't know if you like that, so I'm going to keep going. We have to examine our lives and ask the hard question, is Jesus at the center? And here's my last point. I'm going to wrap it up. I believe to truly balance living today in the now, ups and downs, with my mindset on what I have waiting for me. I have to continually elevate my eyes. What does that mean? It means that my heart and my mind think about my home. That eternity is not far from my thought process. Now listen, we all know people that uh, we could say they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good, right? They just want to get together and, and, and read the Bible, which is a great thing, and pray, and, and they just want to kind of huddle up. There, there's a group of people that lived long ago called the Desert Fathers. I love to read these guys. Great theology, deep. I don't agree with their practice, though, because I don't see anywhere in Jesus' teaching that we should retreat from the world for years on end just so we could get deeper. He's called us to rest and, and retreat, but he's called us to engage, and sometimes people be so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good, but, but sometimes people are so earthly minded that we forget heaven is real. That when the dark night of the soul, that's a phrase that St. John of the Cross used, when, when, when sorrow sets in, we forget that Jesus is still good, that faithful love and goodness still pursue us. When things are great, we think that maybe we don't need Jesus that much anymore, and we've got to elevate our eyes back to eternity, back to the fact 
that Jesus has prepared a place for us and that we don't disregard this life that we've been called to live. We enjoy the blessings that we've been provided. We make much of the opportunity to live in the now, but we do not let the now be the defining factor of our hope and our future. That is Jesus and his presence. You know, I believe that there are so many people in church today that can quote the promises of God. I'm just not sure that we actually know how to live them or believe them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a hope in the future, to prosper you, not to harm you, Jeremiah 29, 11. John 10, 10, I've come to give you life and life to the full. How do we make that a reality? We don't let circumstances dictate our response to Jesus. Let me close with this. In the late 1800s, there was a well-to-do attorney in Chicago named Horatio Spafford. He had a wife, four daughters, successful business. In 1871, tragedy struck through what was the great Chicago fire and Spafford lost all of his real estate holdings. Began to rebuild his life financially in 1873 was the economic turndown. Things again weren't great. The great evangelist D.L. Moody invited Spafford on a trip for a crusade, evangelist crusade in England and he decided he would go with his family to simply get away. The last minute when he was to, to board the ship with his wife and daughters, a business matter arose. He had to stay back, sent them on ahead, said, I'll see you there. M many of you may know the story. While that ship crossed the Atlantic, it struck another sea vessel, and history says it only took 12 minutes for that ship to sink. No text messages, no instant information. Spafford waited, and his wife sent telegram from England that said, saved alone, what should I do? He got on the first boat that he could to go be with his wife. And as they crossed the cold waters of the Atlantic, the captain of that ship told him that he believed they were over the spot where his daughter's watery grave was. At that moment, he would go to his cabin and he would write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way. I love that. Don't like Who, who doesn't want some more peace like a river in your life? You got finances and bills. You got dreams and hopes, you got kids running wild, you got all, who doesn't want a little bit more peace like a river? But then the next line, it's like Horatio Spafford lost his mind, it doesn't even make logical. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, those don't go together, Horatio. Don't put sorrows and peace together. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, we don't use that language a lot, you could say this, whatever I got, whatever I face, whatever my lot, we who know the song, we know it this way. Thou hast taught me to, to say, it is well with my soul. That's not what Horatio Spafford wrote. He wrote, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know. Because what good is what we say if we don't know it to be true in our hearts? What good is information without transformation? Thou hast taught me to know in the highs and the lows that it is indeed well, it is indeed well with my soul. Beloved, I don't know what you're facing today and I don't make light of the challenges that may be in your life and I don't know how good things may be and they may be great, but no matter the lows or the highs, we live today in the right now with our eyes fixed on Jesus because no matter what it is, no matter what you got, you are called to know in the depths of your heart that it is well, it is stays well, and it's gonna be real well with our soul. And so today, I hope you'll take encouragement and comfort in that. And perhaps if there's someone that hasn't said yes to Jesus, there's no other way to say it, but it is not well with your soul. But he stands with arms open wide that if you would believe in what he has done for you on the cross through his death, and if you would believe that he has risen from the dead in victory, if you would believe in your heart, confess your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead, the Bible tells us that because of that, we would receive salvation. And in that moment, it will be well with your soul. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful for these moments we've had together. I'm thankful for the truth of your word that it never returns void. And God, I pray today that we would be encouraged, encouraged to live in the now with faithfulness, but that our hope would be in the future and the day that we see you face to face. Thank you 
for your unending goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.